get this party started. Um, calling to order the, cap the May meeting of the MTA Capital Program Committee. Members of the public wishing to speak, Ms. King? Yes, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. We have four members of the public in person and one remote um, speaker today. As a reminder, we ask that all public speakers please adhere to the MTA's rules of conduct and decorum. I would like to also remind our speakers that in the interest of time and fairness to all speakers, we limit everyone to two minutes. Please be aware there will be a warning beep reminding you that you have 30 seconds to conclude your remarks. Our first speaker will be Jack Nirenberg. Following him will be Paul Carrigan. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jack Nirenberg, Vice President of Passengers United, the leading grassroots advocates for better public transit in New York. So first of all, I do want to bring to, the, to your attention, again, the issue of the Hollis Long Island Railroad Station. Again, it is in a state of disrepair. And based on what I'm hearing at the uh, Long Island Railroad Committee meeting, I'm not hearing any, uh, any effort to really, uh, to really push forward progress in uh, renovating that station so, as, so that it's not only safe for everyone, but it's also accessible for everyone. That also goes with Floral Park. If we want to uh, actually use that station to its uh, biggest potential, that needs to be renovated. It is also in a state of disrepair. Secondly, I want to mention the uh, new turnstiles for the New York City subway, which I was actually really impressed with. I think it was long overdue. I have two questions about it, though. The first is, how much will that cost? And secondly, who will bear that cost? Because as long as that cost is not borne on those uh, lower income uh, families and households who are uh, struggling and rely on public transportation, then it's all good. It's absolutely welcome for the MTA. And uh, lastly, I do want to suggest, because there is a shortage of diesel equipment, and yes, I know that the railroad is also uh, looking into and actually uh, moving forward with an order for new locomotives, but there is a shortage of equipment and as a result, a shortage of service on these branches. So one thing I'm proposing is look into Stadler. They have units that can easily be bought and that are actually hydrogen powered, which are cleaner and are, are uh, train sets easier to use. So that's definitely something I'm recommending too. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker will be Paul Carrigan. Following Paul Pe Carrigan will be Lisa Dagligan. We'll have Lisa Dagligan come, please. Yes, hi, good afternoon. I'm Lisa Daglian, Executive Director of the Permanent Citizens Advisory Committee to the MTA PCAC. Three words, congestion pricing, yay. For the letter of legal sufficiency signaling approval of the EA, issuance of the draft FONSI, and 30-day notice of public availability, accompanied by mitigation measures for potentially affected communities in the Bronx and New Jersey, we're closer to cleaner air, less clogged streets, and critical funding for the tra transit infrastructure that riders rely on. The state's FY24 budget included transparency and open data provisions that will help skeptics of congestion pricing see where the money is going and how it will benefit them directly, and it will. Improved signals in more accessible stations, like Metz Willits Point, expansion projects like Phase 2 of the 2nd Avenue subway and Penn Access, along with new equipment that means less reliance on dinosaurs that should be gathering dust, talking to you, M3s. It's a great opportunity to bring riders this, the system they need uh, and deserve to provide the service they need and deserve. We're hopeful that means finally resolving the quality issues with the M9s. LIRR riders are feeling the pain of the problems at the plant, and we'll still be waiting for delivery of the remainder of the 
remainder of the cars until late 23. We appreciate the oversight by Michael Baker, especially as it demonstrates that the vendor's problems could easily run into delivery of the R211s, which are needed to testing per the 8th Avenue line CBTC program mitigation plan. Less visible, perhaps, but equally as important, is congestion pricing role in MTA's debt and how that affects operations. Comptroller DiNapoli released a report last week and noted additional assistance in the state budget and federal approval for congestion pricing are positive signs that the MTA can gain greater control over its long-term finances and reduce pressure from the capital program on its operating budget. He also stated that our regional economy needs the MTA to regain its strength and win back riders to a safe, reliable, and on-time transit system. That right there is what we're all here for, and we look forward to working with you to make it so. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We'll have Jason Anthony. Uh, following Jason Anthony will be Alita du Dupree, who is remote. Hey, Jano. Hey, Jamie. Uh, finally, finally, we're going to update regarding the R211s and the M9s. But what about the M9As that Metro North are supposed to, to get? Because we need to retire the Metropolitans, better known as the M3As. Because those uh, trains are as old as myself or even older. And regarding the R211, I love the new features that it has because I saw some pictures on the internet over the weekend that indicates us in which side of the door the train will open. That's a feature that uh, Washington Metro actually has, and we hope to see it in every single entity uh, equipment, but not only uh, visual, it could be audio as well. And also, uh, guys, we should implement uh, bilingual uh, announcements on board trains because SunRail in Orlando has it. Why not us? That we are the melting pot of having a huge uh, immigrant and Latinx community and all five boroughs, including the MTA uh, region north and east. And regarding uh, stations, we need an overhaul regarding uh, East New York that is in state of uh, disrepair. And also we need more elevators that I'm glad that 13 stations will be added to the list, but we need more. If we could do it sooner than 2055, that would be great. So I'll yield the rest of my time. I'll see you, I'll see you guys in the next meeting. Thank you. Our final speaker is Alita Dupree. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chair Jano Lieber. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her are going to talk about capital today. I'm looking forward to the presentation about this new uh, motive power for Metro North. It's very meaningful, and I think it's going to be very helpful. Thank you for putting in a report about estimated emissions reduction. This will only be the beginning because we can get renewable fuel and uh, renewable electricity that will improve the numbers uh, even more. So uh, uh, thank you for that. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing about these M9s. I, I, I have been on the M7s and M8s and enjoyed them. Uh, the only thing that I miss about them that I would have done differently with the M789 is I miss the double doors that, that we had on the M1, M3, et cetera. I mean, uh, not a big deal, but I, I really like the double doors and, the, and they have those on BART. Uh, and the, the subway cars, uh, hopefully uh, I will ride on the new R211s. Uh, they certainly look like uh, they hold two ideals of being legendary and stately. Uh, that uh, we can establish some new uh, traditions uh, in our system. And again, Omni and ADA are very important uh, because when I have a bad day, I'm thinking of those who, who can't navigate uh, escalators and elevators. Uh, but as I reframe here in my hopes to come to New York, a 2000 mile trip is still very daunting for me. Uh, it was one of you in a board meeting, don't remember who it was, said something like this 
that the New York City subway uh, is the greatest transportation system the world has ever seen. And I am in full agreement with that. So how do we go forward and build the best subway that we can? I think the work is in progress. And I hope to be back on the system soon. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Mr. Chairman, that concludes the public session for today. Thank you, Liz. Uh, copies of the April Capital Program Committee Minutes have been distributed and are available on our website. Are there any changes or comments on the minutes? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Ms. Lopez, Mr. Glucksman is the second. All in favor? Any opposed? The minutes are approved. Uh, Mr. Dira, are there any changes to the work plan? Mr. Chair, there's no changes to the work plan. <coughs> Great. Let me turn it over to Mr. Torres Springer for the President's report. Thank you, Chair. Members of the committee, um, good to see you all. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I, um, I'm going to uh, uh, do a, a bit of a, an update here and try to be relatively brief because today we're, we have an, an update from all of our MTA agencies on the status of rolling stock work and also from our systems business unit. So there's a lot to cover today. Um, but you know, the work of uh, C&D is ongoing. Um, many of us are, um, are spend time looking at this um, uh, staging area for the replacement of the escalator at uh, Bowling Green Station, which is, you know, I think a good uh, sort of, you know, uh, testament and example of the fact that in a, in a system like ours, as busy as it is, as old as it is, we are emphasizing state of good repair and making the critical improvements that we have to make, even though, and many of us experience this at this station, um, it can be disruptive. Um, and, but we uh, appreciate the patience of the riding public and others uh, as we get this work done. Um, apart from the big uh, updates that we're gonna give today, uh, the work of uh, C&D is ongoing. Uh, throughout the year, we're working hard to design uh, improvements across the system, and state of good repair work across the system, and get it out uh, into contracts um, that we typically award in the latter half of the year. But a lot has gone out already, and uh, I would include in that um, that we have, in fact, put out a procurement uh, to uh, get ADA accessibility work done for uh, Forest Hills Station, Babylon Station, and Hollis Station. Um, that's, uh, that's out there and will get awarded this year. Uh, we'll have more to say on that next month when we provide some additional updates, Chair. Um, what else has been going on over the last month? This month we opened the Biltmore Room entrance between historic Grand Central Terminal and Grand Central Madison. Uh, my friend Rob Troop, our project executive, is here uh, along with uh, Rob Free and others from Long Island Railroad. This is re a real labor of love for, uh, for many who have been invested in creating that direct access and connectivity between Metro North Railroad and Long Island Railroad. We now have eight entrances to Grand Central Madison. And as uh, East Midtown development occurs and goes forward, we will get to 10 entrances. We're also continuing to work on improving wayfinding, getting to a place where retail is able to open. But even as we proceed with these things, the terminal has been a great success with more than 50,000 riders a day. The Biltmore Room is, is truly a great uh, and unique asset, I think, just sort of speaking to the connectivity between Grand Central Madison and the historic terminal and the connectivity that we've achieved between these two railroads. I think everyone, including nodding board members here, uh, have, been, have been very excited about the opening of this entrance and how well those two escalators and the elevator are functioning. Um, I'm sure we'll say lots more at the board this month. Um, the fare evasion um, uh, blue ribbon panel report came out. C&D was proud to play a role uh, to support this and in the follow-up to the fare evasion work that was done by the panel, identifying the physical means of encouraging riders to pay the fare, even while making it easier and more convenient to use our system with some of these more advanced technologies. Um, so, you know, I think just in brief, and we'll talk about this a lot more, I'm sure, in the future, there is a number of short-term improvements that we're focused on uh, coming out of this work. There's the wide aisle gate, uh, the more accessible gate, um, which allows for a more secure entrance into our stations in addition to improving accessibility. That's already rolled out in a pilot form and we'll be continuing to roll those out over the next few months. We also, as uh, the chair mentioned at the event, 
are piloting delayed egress um, for the, the fare gates in the system and looking at some modifications to turnstiles that we can make in the short term to make it more difficult to get over or under them. So that's the short term work. And then in the long term, we will be putting out uh, requests for expressions of interest uh, before the end of the year to think about the future of the fare array in more detail and how it would fit into a system such as ours. But we had some exciting examples in the Vanderbilt room at Grand Central the other day. Um, uh, you know, in sort of short form, what I would say is in contrast or in addition to these wide aisle gates that we're piloting in the system that have the, the paddles that make it much more secure um, uh, compared to the turnstile, they also use advanced technology, something we'll talk about more today uh, with our systems business unit uh, to include sensors uh, for closing and opening so that fare evasion is more difficult and data analytics that allow us to target the various enforcement techniques that have been discussed. So um, those physical changes are uh, both short term and long term. There are going to be some immediate benefits and then uh, we're thinking big about the future of the system and we'll have more to say on that in the future. Of course, um, the, the announcement um, from the federal government and various announcements have taken place um, that we are able to proceed with the Central Business District uh, tolling program. Uh, I just want to emphasize uh, for our part from MTA Construction and Development, this is not only historic because of the congestion and the climate benefits, but also want to emphasize that the proceeds from congestion pricing will be fully dedicated to the MTA capital program making up $15 billion of our capital program uh, in the near future. In the short term, lots gets triggered by this now that we can proceed with. We'll be going out very soon with the first contract uh, for Second Avenue Subway Phase 2, which is unlocked by this uh, ability to access these funds. And we're continuing to move full throttle forward in the remainder of this five-year program with plans for ADA accessibility, and signal modernization for the lines where reliability is needed most. <clears throat> we'll see procurements out soon for all of these projects now that we have the security um, that will have the funding from congestion pricing and also for state of good repair, which I'll come back to uh, in one second. Uh, a, a great example of the importance and, and our ability to do these core infrastructure investments is at Broadway Junction, where we see three major lines within the system intersect. Earlier this month, I, I joined uh, Mayor Adams and other city leaders to celebrate the investments that the MTA is making to make the entire station complex fully ADA accessible, along with steel repairs and painting of the area's elevated structures and the installation of electric bus charging infrastructure. Uh, the city is chipping in as well with investments to improve the public realm around the station, but we're tremendously excited about the potential. You know, we are the largest employer, the MTA, over 2,000 employees uh, in Broadway Junction using the system, and essentially we are rebuilding a station. Uh, it's really three stations in one uh, fully in order to make these ADA investments. It will be transformative for the community, and we were very pleased that the Adams administration worked with the MTA um, to come up with a more comprehensive uh, look at Broadway Junction that allows us to really take advantage of all those benefits. So an exciting announcement, um, but in many ways, the most important thing that's unlocked by congestion pricing is that we can continue to emphasize state of good repair across our aging system. And you'll hear at the board on Wednesday that core infrastructure, including state of good repair, uh, and the normal replacements that we have to do is the key focus of our 20-year needs assessment, which continues to advance. Uh, and to that end, we've been out taking a firsthand look, uh, including last week, uh, Chair Lieber uh, taking a look at the critical behind the scenes equipment like electrical distribution and communication rooms uh, as pictured here. But we are deeply into the system using advanced uh, methodologies like enterprise asset management, working very closely with the operating agencies to assess and prioritize how we keep the system in the state of good repair. And again, it's the funding that was unlocked um, uh, you know, over the last couple of weeks that's gonna enable us to do that on the back end of this capital program. That's my report, Chair. Um, and with that, uh, I think we're moving on to an update on rolling stock. We have updates from all of the MTA agencies today. And uh, to kick us off and give us an overview, uh, we're, uh, we're turning to uh, Steve Plachaki from our, uh, someone who's uh, had tremendous involvement over many years in, uh, in rolling stock management uh, and uh, as part of C&D's contracts department has helped to shepherd a lot of this through. 
Thank you, Jamie. I don't have the uh, infamous clicker, so maybe you can just advance, if you will. All right. Uh, good, morning, good afternoon. I'm Steve Polchaki. I'm the Senior Vice President of Contracts, as announced at CND. Um, today's presentation includes updates on rolling stock contracts for Long Island Railroad's M9s, New York City Transit's R211s, Metro North's SC dual mode uh, 42 locomotives, and a number of uh, different bus models from our bus team. Uh, I'm going to provide a bit of a, an introduction to the rolling stock uh, and uh, attempt to tee up some of the subject matter for our presenters. Uh, during today's presentation, you'll hear that our project teams have been working hard with the various rolling stock manufacturers to hold the schedules and, imp and importantly ensure that our rolling stock is built with the level of quality and safety necessary to perform well in our demanding duty cycle. In terms of performance, our newly delivered rolling stock is not only meeting our contractual mean distance between failure requirements, but significantly exceeding them. Thank you. No, no, let's go back one. There it goes. Um, so I think many folks know uh, by now uh, that we're the largest transit fleet in North America, but an interesting fact, individually, we, have, we hold the title for the three major categories. One, we are the largest fleet with regard to subway cars with 6,500 cars, uh, the largest commuter rail fleet with close to 2,600 pieces of equipment, and the largest bus fleet with over 5,800 buses. Um, that's staggering by anybody's account. Um, I, I've been around the country talking to a lot of different transit agencies over the years, and when they hear these numbers, it's jaw-dropping in terms of how we stack up against the other properties. The numbers I just called out are in some instances double, if not a greater percentage of the next number two fleet sizes in the country, which is sort of you know, a really interesting issue. And why do I bring this up? Because managing this fleet uh, of this size and complexity is a tremendous undertaking. It requires significant wherewithal and expertise in planning, strategic sourcing, production and quality oversight, along with the ability to operate, maintain, and repair these varying fleets to keep them in a state of good repair. So in that regard, an enormous amount of credit goes to the hard work of the project teams that will present today's, or provide today's uh, presentations, and as well as their uh, talented staff that make it all happen. Next. So we've got this very large fleet. And our fleets age and as they become older, obviously, and they become considerably more challenging to maintain, particularly on a, an equipment level basis. Failures become more frequent, planned and unplanned maintenance increases, and predictably, reliability declines. This is why it is so important that we replace our rail car and bus fleet at the end of their useful life. Typically, the useful life of a rail car is 35 to 40 years. You wrap your head around that number, 35 to 40 years. We need to make sure that we buy these products, they last for that period of time. That's a long time. And the useful life of a bus is 12 years. The projects that you'll hear about today are replacing those cars and buses in our fleet that have reached their useful life. Next. So uh, new rail cars, when they come, as well as buses, they bring important benefits to our customers, as well as the MTA. In addition to significantly increased reliability, they introduce a host of new customer-facing amenities, such as digital information screens, brighter LED and more efficient lighting, uh, additional accessibility features, new convenient electron electrical outlets, which we all need to charge our personal devices, improved lavatory features, and CCTV for enhanced security, to just name a few. You'll hear more in the presentations upcoming. In addition, the new rolling stock serves as a driving force behind MTA's commitment to significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Through our hybrid locomotives, as well as our zero emissions bus fleet, those items and those vehicles will help us achieve our goals. So this, this I'm going to try and stay to a script because we're in a rush, but you just got to take a look at this picture on the left when we talk about technical complexity, right? It's, it's just wild. Um, the rolling stock projects, particularly rail stock, which I'm highlighting today, are incredibly challenging for several reasons. First, they're technically complex, involving dozens of systems and subsystems like propulsion, braking, HVAC, suspension, communications, just to, just to name a few. 
all of which require significant engineering and, and integration activities in order for them to perform as designed. If you take a look at this and you look at all of the wires and cabling and con connections that you see in this picture to the left, it's, it, it's a, one, it's a shot that we usually as customers don't get to see, right? This is all buttoned up behind the wall. But when you realize that every one of the bus, buses and cars that we have to oversee have to go this type of build and inspection, it gives you a little bit of insight into what the teams will talk about later in terms of why we have to, and they do a great job holding the car manufacturers and bus manufacturers to their schedules and to the spec. Um, second, the operating environment, including a 24-7, 365 duty cycle, vehicles operating underground, extreme temperatures outdoors, and being exposed to all different types of weather. Third, we have a limitation in the industry. There are only a handful of domestic car builders that are capable of building rail car vehicles to our specifications. And mergers and acquisitions that are occurring in the industry just narrow that particular capacity for us. So what are we doing? We're improving our approach. During last year's report to the Capital Program Committee, we reported challenges with car building staff, staffing, supply chain issues, and other impacts related to COVID-19 pandemic. Since that time, we are pleased to report overall stabilization across rail car projects and bus projects as a result of expanded communication and oversight and additional staffing at key car builders and suppliers. MTA has been working aggressively and collaboratively with the car builders to maintain project schedules and mitigate additional delays. As you'll hear today, we are now working to further improve the delivery of our projects, including efforts of our project management teams to ensure quality in our rolling stock builds, as well as accelerate the pace of production. In addition to all of this, we are also taking sta uh, steps to improve our approach for future rail car and bus projects by taking a hard look at our specifications with an eye towards simplifying our technical requirements, modifying our commercial terms, expanding competition, which we are doing and attempting to do all the time, and better allocating risk, leveraging successful lessons that we've learned through experiences at C and D. Um, during this presentation, and, and I'm, I'm going to cut it short because I could go on all day about this. I love this stuff. But during these presentations, you'll see some pictures and some shots that give you a real bird's eye view of a manufacturing facility. And I have to tell you, if you haven't been to a manufacturing facility and see how complicated it is to build a car or a bus, you'll get a really great view here. And it just gives you a little insight into what our project teams are up against when they hold these car manufacturers and bus manufacturers to the requirement. So sometimes we're, we, we're playing a little bit of a short-term sacrifice, long-term gain play here, right? Where we may have schedule you know, interruptions a bit, but the products that we're getting, and you'll hear about this from our project teams, are really doing the job when we look at the metrics of uh, mean distance between failure. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Anthony Kamanis from Long Island Railroad, and he's going to provide an update on the M9s. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Good afternoon, Chairman and committee members. Uh, my name is Anthony Kamanis. I am Acting Chief Rolling Stock Officer at the Long Island Railroad. Today I will be briefing you on the Long Island's M9 Project Railcar, and you can see on this cover slide uh, that's in one of our M9s in Grand Central Madison. Uh, the M9 trains are a key part of the LAWR's modernization strategy to provide more reliable and comfortable equipment. Uh, they operate in Long Island Railroad's territory, including Grand, Grand Central Madison, and were designed to include new customer amenities that Steve had, had talked about. Uh, some of those approved, improved amenities include a closed loop armrest and improve, improved bathroom features, including touchless faucet, soap dispenser, hand dryer, and uh, improved sliding door, and scratch-proof mirror. And for convenience, uh, electrical outlets are supplied at each row of seats. Uh, to allow customers to better navigate th through the cars, the B end of the car has a powered sliding door that with the touch of a press pad automatically opens the doors of both cars. In addition, each car displays what, what car number you're in. Example, uh, if it's an A-car consist, if you're in car number two, it'll say two of eight. That helps uh, customers know if, if they'll be able to, uh, if they're on a 10 car consist and they're coming to a platform that's only uh, holds eight, they'll, they'll know they'll need to move forward or backward in that consist. And lastly, uh, as Steve had mentioned, CCTVs as a security feature are included on the M9s. 
Since the last report in last June, the schedule and budget have remained on track. Uh, the 202 car order, which was awarded to Kawasaki, consists of 92 base cars and 110 option cars. In an effort to ensure that Kawasaki's current schedule is met, the Long Island Railroad continues to provide the resources needed to support Kawasaki's daily operational testing where the cars are run in simulated revenue service. To date, as you can see, we have conditionally accepted 164 cars and are operate, that are operating throughout the railroad's electrified territory, and the remaining 38 cars are in bigger, uh, various stages of production, assembly, and testing. The railroad has found that Kawasaki requires constant oversight and super supervision of their work by the railroad. As a result, the M9 project team continues to perform rigorous oversight of all of Kawasaki's operations, whether it be manufacturing, final assembly, or testing. Our mandate is not to accept the car until it fully meets the requirements of the contract, has passed simulated operational testing, is determined by the project team to be safe, reliable, and is ready to provide our customers the quality product they deserve. Notwithstanding the delays encountered on the project, as a, as a direct result of the project team's rigorous oversight, the M9 car mean distance between failure exceeds the contract requirement by over 86% and should continue to increase as modifications are implemented throughout the fleet. The 280,000 MDBF is an increase over last year's reported value of 260. Uh, the photo on the slide shows uh, the car body to truck connection in the uh, Kawasaki's Yonkers facility. Uh, some other final assembly steps that take place in Yonkers include underfloor equipment, wiring, luggage racks, seating, and coupler. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I will hand it over to the IEC, and after that, I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah, let, no, let IEC know. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, the IEC is reporting on four vehicle procurement programs, which begin on page 14 of your committee book today. On the Long Island Railroad M9 railcar program, the project is reporting the current budget to be $736 million and forecasts an estimated completion of $731 million. This is a decrease of NEAC of $2.6 million since our last report. While the IEC has also reduced our EAC forecast, it is our opinion that the project will finish at the budgeted amount of $736 million. Regarding the schedule, as reported by Anthony Kamanis, the project is forecasting delivery to main cars uh, at Kawasaki facilities in July and acceptance completion of the last of the 202 vehicles in September of this year. The IEC finds that to date conditional acceptance has been below plan with 32 vehicles accepted since our last report. This, which can be attributed to quality issues which apply to each car and require time for correction, as detailed in our reports. And so it's the IEC's opinion that due to the quality issues, risk to the project's September 23 date still exists and acceptance will likely be by December 23, as three months slip since the last report. It is important to note first that the IEC continues to endorse and support the Long Island Railroad practice of holding off on vehicle acceptance until they are assured all quality issues have been addressed as per contractual requirements. And secondly, as mentioned, however, despite the quality issues experienced on this project, the IEC notes that the mean distance between failure rate continues to far exceed contractual requirements. And that concludes my report on the m Okay. Thank you for the IEC. It's against, it's, it's against our nature, but we're celebrating that we're getting, in fact, twice the, twice the durability uh, and MDBF of, of what the contractual requirement is. But... Uh, but obviously, we're uh, we're also getting through the the quality issues, and I'm I'm excited that the all the all these uh, cars are finally getting to the system. What's next? I have a question. Yeah. So, I, I, explain to me the schedule. Are we going to make it September 23, or we're not going to make September 23? Yes, we anticipate that we will make this September uh, 23. The, the, the point, uh, Chair Mahaltz, is, is that. The IEC is second-guessing the agency and saying they're going to be three months late. Right. That's a healthy debate <laughs> that uh, I'm sure the agency would like to win by performing. Uh, Rob. I, just as an example, um, we've had flooring issues with Kawasaki. Uh, their repairs called for about a 12-day 
uh, repair cycle. Mm -hmm. Our project team worked vigorously with them and identified a way to do it in half that time. So it's things like that that we're working with them that we think we can recover that time and meet the schedule. But it's because of your hand, the hands-on of everybody who's involved that's keeping these guys to their schedule. Absolutely. And do they owe us 38 cars? How many cars do they owe? They, so that, that graph before you had 164, 38, what was, I was confused. Correct. They always 38 cars. 38 cars. Okay. Can you okay. explain conditional acceptance? Because the, even the cars that have been conditionally accepted require some, what you might call Training. punch list items, okay. to be addressed over time. So that has to be scheduled, and they have to bring them into the shop. Go ahead. That's correct. So we have two contract terms. One is conditional acceptance, where we accept the car uh, with open items, and those open items, they're non-safety related, are addressed later on in the in the program. Uh, and then there's final acceptance, which uh, we do not give them until all those open items are, are completed. And how long do you think it's going to take them between acceptance to final, I mean, partial acceptance to final acceptance? Is well, it months? Is it a week? You know. Well, that becomes your, your FMI program, which right. uh, could thing. last a couple of years right. as we cycle okay. the cars, bring them out of revenue service, do the FMIs, and then get them back into service. A lot of it is that you have to organize the shop so that you're doing similar, so these similar mm -hmm. punch list items. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you have all, all the, the, the shop capacity to do these similar items in, in the right schedule, so it tends to take a little bit of time. But it doesn't keep the cars out of revenue service, right? That's the key. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, cries of joy that we're doing so well? No, that never happens. All right. There you go. Mr. Solomon. Just a question about l looking ahead in the future. Um, you saw on one of the slides the picture to demonstrate the complexity with all the wiring, et cetera. Uh, and then in, I think in the following slide where you're looking to simplify technical requirements. So how do you untangle that mess of wires and what kind of thinking have you been doing so we can perhaps avoid the complexity in the future? Well, I, I think what we, I don't know that you're ever going to untangle that web of wires, um, but the issue is for us to look at perhaps more fungible solutions that exist, you know, in the industry. In other words, in a car build, unlike a bus build, but in a car build, everything that we buy is designed specifically for our application. But the ability to leverage technology that's out there from other properties and look to simplify some of the requirements can help us in that way, leveraging designs that are already existing out there. So we've been looking at that from time to time, and we're trying to get, we've got our consultants as well as our staff looking at ways to leverage that. So we believe that we'd be able to, we may be able to simplify some of our tech requirements and then take advantage of more fungible solutions that are out there. If I may, this is part of a, uh, an emphasis on decustomization that C&D has been pursuing for some time. And Jamie's, under Jamie's leadership, it's going forward. You know, we're, we're, we're the biggest procure of all kinds of stuff in the transit industry, which over time has led, you know, uh, historically has led to customization. I, I like it this way. I like it that way. And you start to become a customizer. We want to be decustomizing. We want to be using the light bulb that everybody else in the industry uses, right? So that's a way of one of the strategies for saving money uh, over time. And it's this is one area where it's especially important. Next up. Sukal. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Suko, Vice President and Chief Mechanical Officer of Car Equipment. Department of Subways. Today I'll be presenting New York City Transit Subway Car Program. So this slide shows that replacing older cars with newer cars, we experience a safer and much more reliable fleet. I'd like to highlight that the overall reliability of the Millennium Fleet. I need to learn how to use this. <laughs> just need to you need to go back. Press the, there's a back arrow. Yeah, I just yeah. there you go. Okay. You okay. Got it. So I'm um, going to say this slide shows that replacing older cars with new cars, we experience, we experience a safer and much more reliable fleet. And to highlight the overall reliability of Millennium Fleet is two and a half times higher than the legacy fleet. And the R211 project is next in fleet renewal. Okay. So the R211 contract was awarded to Kawasaki in February 2018 for 535 cars. 
Last November, with the continued support of our partners at the FTA, we exercised option one to add another 640 cars. Currently, our budget remains on track with the base order of $1.75 billion and the option one at $1.92 billion. We are also on schedule to complete the base order by January 2025, as we presented last year. Some interim milestones, such as the delivery of the R211T open gangway pilot cars, have slipped, but Kawasaki's primary parts facility is a year ahead of production. This ensures that the production lines in Lincoln, Nebraska, will have uh, sufficient primary parts. And the uh, New York City Transit's R211 project team will continue to work with Kawasaki to achieve the necessary ramp up to meet the final delivery of the base order contract. So this is, I'm sure, the picture that Steve was uh, referencing earlier, where we're showing the facility of Lincoln, Nebraska, where it's about 750,000 square feet, roughly the size of 13 football fields. So you know, we're seeing right now that the two lines are populated. So Kawasaki currently have expanded to, to have two full production lines, and they are also at really above their staffing plans. This represents incredible progress from a year ago when they were struggling to hire and keep employees. So. <laughs> if you like subway cars and you've never been to a facility, you gotta love this. But, Sue, just back this up, I'm sorry. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I gotta jump in here. Just back this up one. One slide. Okay. Just one slide. What, what Sue has got here in these pictures, all of this, that's a wheel axle, right, with the wheels. These things are humongous. They're, they're, they, you can't really pick up how big they are here, but all of this equipment, that stage, and if you see in the back of this picture, that's the next slot. All of these pieces of equipment and systems and subsystems fills this manufacturing line as these cars get built. So this is, this is 13, 14 football fields worth of equipment and cars all being built at the same time. It's, it's staggering to wrap your head around it, but when you look at these pictures, they're just, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a contracts weenie, so I, I really get off on it. This stuff is incredible, and you really gotta really appreciate this. Just hit the next picture, Sue. This is like, and then the sides of these, right? This is where they stage and they move all this, you know, sort of like huge equipment in, in order to feed the line. It's, it's just a great shot. Thank you, Steve. Sorry. <laughs> Are those the M9s? On Can, the uh, background? <laughs> yes. So that everything's being produced in the same, yes. same shop? Yes, different lines. Okay. Yeah. Yes. And then I'm going to suggest we let Sue uh, go on with her presentation. Okay. So um, in addition to increased staffing, there has been process improvements as well. On the left, the photo shows the materials strategically staged by the assembly line and by each workstation. On the right, Kawasaki has invested in digital displays at every workstation. This allows all employees to follow the simple and direct work instructions. This also means new employees can get up to speed quickly. So the R211A standard cars um, will be serving New York City Transit's B division, starting with the A and C lines. These cars will be supporting the 8th Avenue CBTC project where we will need 300 cars by August of 2024, a critical milestone that we are aware of and working hard to achieve. As you can see in the photo on the right, the prototype train went into in-service testing carrying passengers on March 10th this year. We also received two additional trains for training. Status of the R211S, which will be replacing the Staten Island Railway's aging R44s with state-of-the-art trains. Earlier this month, New York City Transit received the first five-car prototype train. It's undergoing testing and will transfer to Staten Island to complete qualification testing. The prototype train is targeted to begin in-service testing by the end of this year and the production car delivery is scheduled to start by March of 2024. 
The first pilot R211T open gangway cars arrived in November of last year. With testing now underway, we'll be evaluating the hard shell and soft shell gangways. The photos to the right show both designs. The extensive evaluation process will include an in-service test, which we plan to start by the end of this year. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Mr. DeVito. Go first. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank ahead, you. Joe. On the R211 subway car program, with the exercise of the option order for 640 additional cars in November 22. The program budget and EAC have increased from $1.75 to $3.67 billion. The program has had no other budget changes. At last report, the R211 program had experienced an 18-month schedule slip since the award. The project schedule currently reflects between zero and three months delay due to interim milestones while holding the end date of January 2025 for the base order of the 535 cars. The IEC acknowledges that Kawasaki has made significant progress to reduce the duration of the final car assembly stage, and the IEC endorses the initiatives underway to ensure fleet performance meets requirements. Further improvement is required to achieve the necessary 23 cars per month production rate, which would maintain the January 25 substantial completion date. Regarding the 300 R211 cars needed for testing by August of 24, Per the 8th Avenue CBTC program mitigation plan, it's the IEC's opinion based on our analysis that this date may not be met and additional ramp up time may be required. The CBTC and R211 projects must closely coordinate and determine if action is necessary to increase the vehicle production rate. Consideration should be given to increasing production through actions such as adding more shifts, increasing production line staff, extending the work shifts, and or working weekends. Our two recommendations are simple. Since Kawasaki has not been able to achieve the necessary level of quality at the time of vehicle delivery of the M9s to meet the contractual requirements, the IC recommends New York City Transit closely monitor Kawasaki's, Kawasaki's quality program to ensure it meets acceptance criteria and maintain schedule to avoid the same issue from occurring on this project. In order to meet the, improve the production rate, the IC recommends New York City Transit review Kawasaki's schedule, and take the appropriate actions as we just spelled out to meet production requirements if necessary. And that concludes my report on the R211 fleet. Any comments or questions from the board? Ms. Mihalcis. Okay, so, um, so you said, a, and I remember this, I'm sorry Neil's not here to listen to it. I guess um, Kawasaki in Nebraska was having a very hard time hiring. So they turned their place around and was able, to, and hired all these people, and I guess we are watching over them, and this is how we're going to meet the schedule well, in simple terms? They, they definitely have turned that around, and they were able to hire, as a matter of fact, right now they have more than enough people that they need for the production lines, because they're gearing towards uh, the two full production lines, and you know this is a good time to have more people because they could shadow the senior folks, and then when they're off on their own to, to go ahead and do the work, when they expand the lines even further. Mm -hmm. So the, they, they definitely did make a lot of improvements since last year. Okay. And we watch over them the way we do for the railroad cars? Y yes, we do. As a matter of fact, we follow their training program for their folks, which is very extensive. They have people going into a basically a, almost like a lab type of environment. And then, like I said, they go and shadow the folks in, in the actual line to, uh, that's performing the work. Okay, thank you. And Sue, so just to be clear, you, ha you have people in the facility that report yeah. to you yes. that are, yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. I have uh, resident inspectors, lead inspectors, engineers there. Great. And we, we actually go there quite often ourselves. Uh, that was my next question. Yeah, I, I was actually there beginning of May, okay. and I actually saw the improvements, and I was actually very happy with it. Great. Okay, thank you. Does Jamie, does, does anybody from the project team, I see Mark Roche is here, want to comment on the 8th Avenue uh, and how adjust, they're adjusting to the risk that the IC has identified? Uh, Janet, the team has been working together with the car suppliers to work up some particular plans, and we set some interim targets that we can keep the project going as long as they're met. Um, so we're, we're working closely together to make sure we're integrated. I think that's probably the, the summary out at this stage.
No other questions. That takes us to um, the uh, J Joe Reynolds with an update on Metro North dual mode locomotives. Good afternoon. My name is Joseph Reynolds, Senior Director at Metro North for Rolling Stock Delivery and Integration. Uh, I will be providing a status update on Metro North dual mode locomotive program. Metro North's update on rolling stock today pertains not to cars, but to locomotives. Specifically, our dual mode locomotives fleet that pull our coaches and provide service throughout our entire diesel and third rail territory. The new SC42 dual mode locomotives purchase will replace the aging P32s, which are at or beyond their useful life. The new SC42s will be state of the art and much more reliable and significantly greener. When Metro North purchased the P32 several decades ago, dual mode technology was in its infancy. And the primary benefit was confined to electric operations within Manhattan, uh, primarily approaching and departing Grand Central Terminal. The rest of the time, in, even in electrified territory, the P32s operated in diesel mode. Since then, the technology has evolved and improved, and this new generation of dual mode locomotives will be able to operate in electric mode throughout the entire electric territory. This means, um, as you can see up on the map, uh, up until Croton, Harmon on the Hudson Line, up to Southeast on the Harlem Line, and out to Pelham on the New Haven Line. A cumulative increase uh, of operation from four miles in, uh, to an electric territory of 102 miles. This will have a major positive impact on our environment. By running in electric mode rather than diesel, we will emit 25,000 tons fewer of met carbon um, emissions annually. In addition to noise, and uh, there's also air quality benefits. And that's not all. You know, even when operating in diesel mode, these modern locomotives will have significantly reduced airborne emissions. With pollutants like nitrogen oxide, and particulates dropping by more than 80%. Uh, all right. Um, let me now update you on the status of the project. The contract was awarded to Siemens in March of 2021. It is an FTA funded program as such, in full compliance with Buy America requirements, the locomotives will be built in the United States, more specifically in Sacramento, California. Things are proceeding well. There are no changes to the budget and overall schedule since I reported last year. As scheduled, the design was completed at the end of last year, and excitingly, manufacturing of the first pilot locomotive has begun and ahead of schedule. The current orders for 22 dual mode locomotives it was a base order of 19 and an option for eight additional locomotives. Under this contract, additional potential options are available. Please note uh, the quantities listed on the slide. Thanks to lessons learned across the MTA portfolio, we are not resting on our laurels and will continue to aggressively manage the project to ensure that the results is a high quality product. Example of this have included constant coordination as first article inspections have begun in the early manufacturing process. Our manufacturer Siemens has heard constantly from us that we are not and will not be accepting anything but the exacting standards laid out in our contract. We are partnered, 
we have therefore partnered together to achieve our common objective. And our teams are motivated to get the job done right the first time around. That concludes my presentations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Uh, DeVito. Thank you. <clears throat> On the Metro North dual mode locomotive program, at approximately 35% time elapsed, this project remains on schedule with acceptance completion of all 27 dual mode locomotives due in April of 2027. Likewise, the current budget and EAC of $414 million remain unchanged since last report, and the IEC finds there is sufficient budget to complete the current scope of work. One comment the IEC has, it's the IEC's understanding that, the, that a diesel exhaust fluid storage and dispensing system which is required for the diesel fuel additive to achieve the expected 85% emission reduction on the new locomotives will be included in a separate project. And that concludes my comments on the dual mode. Good news. Any comments or questions on the Metro North loco procurements? Okay. Uh, onward to buses. Who speaks for buses? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and committee members. My name is Daniel Cardoza. I'm the Vice President and Chief Maintenance Officer for New York City Transit, Department of Buses, and the MTA Bus Company. And I will provide an update on our bus fleet. I'll begin with an overview of our current bus fleet. Our existing bus fleet consists of approximately 5,800 buses operating out of 28 bus depots citywide. We have the largest fleet in the country and operate one of the harshest duty cycles in North America. The useful life of a bus is 12 years and our average fleet age is approximately seven years. We saw a six month improvement from last year due to the recent deliveries of buses to replace the eldest buses in the fleet. The capital program enables us to continue to replace our aging fleet while introducing new technology. Quick update to the 2015 to 2019 capital plan. To date, 96% of the buses have been accepted for revenue service. The remaining 70 buses are in production, consisting of 25 clean diesel and 45 battery electric buses. These two orders were combined with part of the 20 to 24 plan projects. The 20 to 24 capital program consists of 2,435 buses. Of the total program, 23% have been delivered and another 18% are in production. 44% are in various stages of procurement. Details to follow on the next slides. In order to begin our journey towards a fully electric fleet, our recent local bus deliveries include new electrified components. These components experienced infancy failures However, we are applying very important lessons learned to our current and future orders as we transition to a zero emissions fleet. We continuously work with our vendors and our depots in analyzing bus performance data. We declare fleet defects when applicable and we direct our vendors to investigate root cause of failures and develop corrective actions to both buses in service and in production. We can now say that these buses are operating consistently and our reliability continues to improve. As we approach the 10,000 mile MDBF contract goal, the 40 foot transit hybrid and diesel buses show 100% improvement to the MDBF in the last 12 months. And our Prevo coaches, which operate in a different duty cycle, continue to excel with an MDBF average of over 21,000 miles in the last 12 months. We currently have six bus contracts that are all on budget and are either in production or scheduled to line enter soon. As reported last year, all bus manufacturers experienced labor shortages and absenteeism, which resulted in production rate slowdowns. In addition, one bus manufacturer experienced a 10-week labor strike last summer, and another manufacturer is experiencing delays due to a NHTSA recall. The supply chain still has not fully recovered since the pandemic, which has resulted in delivery delays. Our managers meet regularly with the principals and executive officers of each bus manufacturer to ensure their awareness and commitments to resolving the issues and mitigating further delays. We work closely with each bus manufacturer to ensure that only quality buses are accepted on a daily basis 
and we continue to assess liquidated damages with every payment. Although the supply chain is volatile, bus manufacturers have worked tirelessly and are super committed to delivering quality buses on target. We are continuing to make progress toward our zero emissions fleet conversion. The 60 battery electric buses are in production. The pilot buses are expected to begin in-service evaluations later this year. To enhance safety of these buses, all future battery electric buses, the bus manufacturers will include an early warning system to detect potential thermal hazards in the high voltage systems. Last year, we awarded a contract to Nova Bus for the purchase of five test battery electric buses. This pilot is expected to begin its in-service evaluation later this year in Q4. These are the first battery electric buses we've purchased from this manufacturer, thus increasing competition. We are currently in the procurement process for 470 battery electric buses, which we expect to award in the fourth quarter of this year. Last year, we were successful in obtaining funding for this bus purchase through the Low No Grant Program. This was the largest grant awarded to any U.S. transit agency. Applications for additional funding through the same program have already been submitted for this year. As part of our strategy for the purchase of future zero emissions buses, as well as the necessary infrastructure, we have contracted with a consultant to perform a detailed transition study. The study includes battery electric bus technology evaluation, electric bus technology evaluation, charging infrastructure assessments, schedule feasibility studies, resiliency modeling. This study is scheduled to be completed in September of this year. And I am pleased to announce that we are a proud recipient of the FTA's Champion of the Challenge Award for our overall zero emissions bus transition plan. And I should mention also that we won NYSERDA's Electric Truck and Bus Challenge, which allowed $8 million to be made available for the two bus hydrogen pilot in the Bronx. Mr. DeVito, who are we? All right, Mr. Cardoso, a couple more slides. The bus improvement section begins with a new configuration to our bus passenger seats. Our aim is to enhance our customer experience and provide additional accessibility accommodations. Our automatic bus lane enforcement program uses cameras to keep bus lane clear of vehicles and buses on schedule for faster and more reliable service. The MTA will more than double the number of buses equipped with ABLE to over 1,000 by the end of this year. This expansion of camera enforcement will cover up to 80% of bus lanes by the end of 2023. Bus customers have been asking for better speeds and shorter wait times. The bus lane enforcement cameras have repeatedly proven to be an effective tool in improving bus service, a fundamental initiative of our faster, cleaner, safer plan. Since the inception of the program, over 250,000 summonses have been issued across 16 routes covering all five boroughs. ABLE enforced corridors not only show a 5% increase in speed on top of the benefits gained from bus lanes, but also show a significant decrease in collisions. Further, beginning next year, the ABLE expansion bill included in the final state budget will allow for ticketing vehicles outside of the bus lanes that are stopped at bus stops or that are double parked. Additional bus improvements include the installation of bike racks on 110 buses operating on three routes in Queens, Staten Island, and Manhattan. And lastly, by the end of 2023, approximately 80% of the fleet will be equipped with digital information screens. And that concludes our report, and I'll turn it over to Joe. Mr. DeVita. Thank you, Mr. Joe. On the bus program, the IEC is monitoring 17 bus contracts as outlined in our report. While the five completed projects for 1,053 buses valued at $778 million had incurred delays due to technical and material issues resulting from the COVID pandemic, the eight active projects for 480 vehicles valued at $437 million have had no further schedule slippage or cost increases since our last report in June of 2022 apart from the battery electric bus contract. Proposals have been received, as been mentioned, on four contracts for 970 buses currently in procurement, one of which is for the 470 battery electric buses. 
regarding the active battery electric bus contract status. Contracts for 60 buses have been delayed and are now planned to be completed by September 2024, a 10-month slip since last report. The longer than planned development of an early warning detection system, a key safety feature, was the cause of the delay. The IEC has several comments. The completed bus contracts had experienced performance issues. Manufacturers and vendors have identified the root causes for these technical and quality issues and are working to develop and implement corrective actions on the active contracts. The IEC concurs with the MTA strategy of not accepting buses until all technical and quality issues are resolved and meet contractual requirements. And lastly, upon receipt of the zero emissions fleets transition study mentioned earlier, the IEC will provide our assessment of the cost, infrastructure requirements, and impact of the transition from legacy to a zero emissions bus fleet. That concludes our comments. Thank you. See if there are any board, board questions, question, remaining board questions. I, I just like, Chair, I'd just like to say by way of wrap up, I mean, we, you know, we heard an enormous amount of detail, but four, four agencies reporting on rolling stock programs that are on budget. Um, and, you know, that pr there were probably, you know, here and there, uh, a month here, a month there, uh, in terms of schedule issues, but, um, you know, really successful year for uh, these many professionals who are managing an extraordinarily complex uh, part of our work. I mean, rolling stock, as Steve, I think, you know, very articulately explained at the outset, um, there are a lot of factors in this international supply chain that are beyond our control and uh, seeking the performance of, uh, of vendors um, in, uh, in an industry that has been severely disrupted um, and that is very complex to manage. And yet we, we see that this rolling stock uh, effort is moving along uh, quite well by each of the agencies and, you, you know, as I say, on budget and largely on schedule. Um, we know that there are challenges looming ahead. Uh, I should mention, uh, you know, since it was brought up earlier in, in questions, the, the uh, procurement for M9A is still under negotiation. Um, it is a, a very complex negotiation. We expect to have news on that in the coming months, but um, it, it, you know, all of this shows to us that uh, we not only have great leadership to manage uh, these, these vendors uh, and suppliers who are producing this rolling stock, but also we have to step up and figure out how to confront the long-term issues as well. Um, but all in all, we're very pleased with uh, what we heard today, Chair. It's a great summary. Anybody else? Um, I just got to say, uh, you saw on display Steve Plachaki's passion for, um, for rolling stock. Um, but it goes broader than that. Steve's passion for procurement and for the MTA, and um, this is a, you know this is a little bit Steve's swan song because Steve is retiring next month, oh. and um, I'm going to celebrate you in another context. And um, um, I've always I always kid Steve about so many things, and I will miss him for so many reasons. But I think the MTA, um, the legacy that. Uh, Steve has given us is passion for delivering for the public, um, even in stuff that seems arcane to the rest of the world. Um, and y you are the gold standard. And, and I just want to acknowledge as MTA, C, and D came together consolidating all these different capital organizations around the agency, you led the various uh, folks who had done procurement at different agencies to come together, together with Evan Iceland at C&D and to create a great new capital procurement organization that really is second to none. And that every year now we're on, we're doing 10 billion plus a year of capital procurements. Nobody's ever done that before. So a big thank you to you in one of your last couple of years for what you, what you set in motion and the legacy that you're leaving behind and I just I just have to say it with all my heart thank you uh, thank you very much I, I I've been here for 35 and a half years and I have to tell you it is an absolutely phenomenal place to work if you're the type of person like I am that just can't tolerate being bored this is your home <laughs> there's always something to do there's always a challenge and I have to tell you the thing that I will miss the most are the people here, they are just top shelf, and they give it every single day. And, uh, and I'm really proud to have been part of it. Thank you. Now, okay. 
Slight, slightly, I admit, anticlimactically, we have a report from our systems business unit. Right. Um, Ma okay. Mark Beans talked about, but about some real cutting edge and important work that is going on at CND, led by Mark. Thank you for that introduction, Jamie. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Beanstock, and I'm the Systems Business Unit Lead. The Systems Business Unit was established last year to develop within C&D an expertise in mission-critical systems and control center operations, which incorporate multiple disparate systems to manage the operation of the subway system. We will provide expert project delivery from planning through execution for MTA critical systems, including control centers, emergency and customer communications, security cameras, and surveillance systems. In addition, the business unit will integrate advanced technology into NYCT assets and serve as the center of excellence for industrial and systems engineering. The Systems BU currently manages 102 active projects with a total budget of over $2 billion. 34 of those projects are in construction. In addition, Transit Wireless, our partner in the cellular Wi-Fi $1 billion expansion, has started the installation of new fiber optic cables in the Rockaways, taking advantage of available work opportunities and contracting synergies. We plan to start work in July at the Times Square shuttle. A system is a collection of different elements that together produce results not obtainable by the elements alone. The Systems BU integrates various elements to deliver systems for our customers, both internal and external. Shown here are examples of various systems upgraded and improved by the Systems Business Unit. Old analog emergency booth communication system telephones were replaced with a new high-speed digital system with redundant communications paths. Obsolete radio systems were upgraded to new reliable radio systems for subways communications. Static paper customer information centers were replaced with new dynamic digital information centers. And old public address st systems within stations, often hard to hear, were replaced and upgraded and are continued to be upgraded with new digital audio PA systems and upgraded LCD screens. Not pictured here, but equally important, we upgrade the communications and fiber optic communications infrastructure, install uninterruptible power supplies, communications room cooling systems, fire detection and alarm systems, access control systems, CCTV and security systems, all the systems and infrastructure necessary to keep our facilities, subways, and bus service operating. In 2022, the Systems BU awarded 25 projects with a total budget of $337 million, in addition to finalizing a $1 billion license agreement with Transit Wireless to provide cellular service in all subway tunnels and Wi-Fi in all above-ground stations. Some examples are shown in the photos on the left. We also completed 18 projects with a total budget of $174 million, examples of which can be seen in the photos on the right. In 2023, we plan to award 18 projects and complete an additional 25 projects. A sample of these projects is listed on the screen and shown in the photos on the bottom of the screen. In the next couple of slides, I would like to talk about a few projects with Spotlight to Systems Approach and the new way we are delivering complex technology projects. The BMT Traction Power Control Center upgrade project was awarded in September 2022 to improve the reliability and operation of the BMT traction power system. It will begin to modernize the power control center by replacing the antiquated master terminal units with a new state-of-the-art video wall and monitors. An emergency backup power control center will also be constructed to provide system redundancy. This project is the first one in a series of projects to upgrade and replace obsolete components installed nearly 30 years ago. The upgrade for the IRT SCADA system will begin preparation of a design-build RFP soon, and the upgrade to the IND SCADA is in planning. In addition, we are working closely with our MTA IT partners to deliver a unified head-end for all three divisions and planning for the technology refreshes necessary to keep the system in a state of good repair throughout its operating life cycle. The UHF radio system replacement project demonstrates the approach of systems thinking to de-risk projects, significantly improve delivery timelines, and reduce cost. The original plan for this project included the construction of 10 new radio sites in New York City. Systems was able to identify a new approach to deliver a better radio system by partnering with the MTA police 
and becoming a user on their new metropolitan regional radio system. The scope now includes the installation of radio consoles and workstations at the Operations Control Center and the purchase of handheld and mobile radios and licenses to enable the users to communicate. This approach reduced the project cost by $35 million, reduced project delivery schedule by 20 months, eliminate the risk of constructing new radio sites in New York City, provides for a larger radio coverage area, and utilizes more radio channels, resulting in increased system capacity. Passenger station local area networks, or PSLANs, enable systems installed in stations to communicate with the operations control center and various MTA data centers. These projects listed here expanded these networks in support of other initiatives and projects, thereby reducing the technology risk to other projects and facilitating their timely delivery. Systems is continuing to deliver enabling technologies for other MTA initiatives, including CCTV at fair arrays for security and the fair evasion detection. Now I would like to introduce Paul Corrigan, who is the Vice President of Industrial and Systems Engineering in C&D and Delivery, to update you on the work being done to provide resiliency at the Operations Control Center. Okay, thank you, Mark, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I will introduce the Industrial and Systems Engineering practice by discussing recent plans and progress in one of our more important, most important system areas, the Operations Control Center, and its future in the heart of a high-performance integrated operation. As a reminder, the OCC is New York City Transit's hub for subway operations. It's a large, resilient, 24-7, 365 facility. Scores of operations staff work as a team of teams leading service management, customer communication, and plant management decision-making to deliver safe, effective, and reliable service. In August 2001, an incident occurred at the Rail Control Center which resulted in a loss of power to several critical systems and severely impacted train service. To address this, we are investing in strengthening the facility's resiliency and performance. We have near-term and mid-term projects that are providing security upgrades, digital infrastructure upgrades, and facility infrastructure upgrades. This has included installation of uninterruptible power supplies on key equipment and workstations, redistributed electrical loads for power diversification and providing additional training and developing new operations and maintenance procedures. These projects are nearing completion with many key features already in place. We also have capital projects entering procurement this year to further harden the systems in the building and provide more resilient HVAC and power. However, we're also looking to the future of the OCC with these and other issues in mind, and I'd like to discuss our approach to those challenges next. The service management, plant management, and customer communication functions at the OCC are all driven by increasing numbers of interacting systems, and they themselves interact constantly with one another. We're reaching a point where it is impossible to get quality performance through a piecemeal approach, looking at one technology at a time. Instead, it's necessary to zoom out and look at the system of systems level to ensure the proper integration of these functions and unlock the full potential of technology, people, processes, and information at the facility. So let me give one example just to illustrate the point, which is notifications. As you've probably experienced with your own emails and texts and apps, too many alerts and notifications can diminish rather than enhance your ability to be productive and stay on top of priorities. Similarly for us, the new technologies and other systems that have been added to the OCC over the past two decades, we're reaching a point now where the notifications that come with this new data strain the ability of even the most dedicated staff to stay on top of them. Service alerts, customer alerts, and plant alerts all stream into the OCC. They come from our own internal staff and systems, our agency partners, and from the public. And they're presented in a wide variety of ways, audible alerts, pop-ups, notifications, phone calls, and more. This illustrates what system systems thinking is about. The OCC's core need in managing routine incident and emergency conditions is accessing actionable information. To do it well requires a clear ordered alignment of systems and information. 
without considering all of the alerts going on in the OCC, there's no way to evaluate if a new technology, say a new elevator adage tracker, for example, has appropriate alert processes in place and fits into the environment. Looking across all systems is critical to manage user attention, comprehension, and stress in the real-time operation. Ultimately, a system of systems approach helps us to prioritize needs and develop the overall path forward in complex system challenges like the OCC and beyond. Earlier this month, we kicked off a shaping study to pull together a comprehensive list of system, facility, and operational challenges like these at the OCC and started sketching a, an approach to addressing them. And we'll inform, this will inform the creation of a strategic plan for the OCC, which will start later this year. We will keep the board informed as this planning process progresses. I hope this short introduction gives you a flavor of what industrial and systems engineering is about, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mark and Paul. Questions? Um, well, we want to we want to thank Mark and Paul for their uh, for their hard work. I mean, there's a there's a lot there's a lot more detail that we can get into, but there's a lot of cutting edge work happening in the systems business unit. And also uh, credit to Mark Roche, the director, the head of our uh, delivery um, department, um, for uh, spurring a lot of this innovation. So more to come on that. Okay, I think we're going to do procurements very quickly, Mr. Iceland. Yes, sir. Um, I'm presenting seven procurement actions this month, totaling $74.9 million. The uh, items are described in detail um, in the staff summaries contained in your committee books. Um, the items include a contract extension to continue programming, construction management, and inspection of services for the Central Business Tolling Program, a modification to address system and cybersecurity upgrades for the MTA Police Department's radio system, Two modifications to address deterioration and corrosion of existing electrical systems at the 53rd Street tube. And this one will include some time extension and impact costs. A modification to replace critical components to the cooling plant at the Robert Moses Building at the RFK Bridge facility. And there are also two ratifications. The first is a time extension and associated impact costs for the Eastside Access contract for passenger experience enhancement, enhancements and finish detailing. And last is a modification to replace an additional 42 deteriorated steel columns on the concourse line between 161st Street and 167th Street in the Bronx. So again, all of these items are in your book, and I submit them for your consideration and vote. Anybody want to ask questions or comment on any of this? Mr. Albert. On the uh, item for TC Electric, which is the rehabilitation of the 53rd Street tube, why does it say Rutgers tube on the top of the page? Rutgers tube was the original project that we put out. This was uh, uh, a modification. We added 53rd Street tube to that project in an effort to deliver it more quickly. We've gotten caught up with some of the electrical systems components that have taken a long time to order and, and repair, but it was the original Rutgers tube contract. And it's the same contractor? It's the same contractor. Thank you. And I note they did a great job. Uh, they were the ones who got us who did the L train contract and they did uh, and we and they ultimately won the uh, the Rutgers contract and then we piled on and gave them another piece of work in the Rutgers contract because during COVID we were knocking it out, taking advantage of uh, low ridership to do extra work. Any other questions or comments? I'll move the items, do I have a second? Second, second Ms. Barbas. Any opposition or abstention? The items carry. With that, may I have a motion to adjourn? Mr. Glucksman, Mr. Bringerman, we are adjourned. Thank you.